Hitting hard drives from the back of the court is one of the best ways to move forward and take over the kitchen. If you can't get enough power though, going for these drives can be a death sentence. So in today's video, I'm gonna give you all the tools so that your drives are more powerful and more effective. And guys, I just wanted to say that 80% of you watching this aren't subscribed to our channel. So if you like our videos, make sure to head just below the video and click the subscribe button. It really helps us grow. Before we get all technical though, there's a few things I want you to keep in mind. And the first is that getting good amount of power on any shot, but especially on our drives, has very little to do with strength. So if you're not the strongest person, don't feel like you can't hit hard because you don't have that strength. So good power comes from good technique and a few other things that I'm gonna show you, but it actually has very little to do with strength. So if you go to the courts, you've probably seen really skinny, scrawny people that can hit super hard. So don't feel like because you're not a very strong person, you can't hit hard. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you're trying to hit the ball hard, you really need to be using topspin. And the reason for that is when you use topspin, it makes the ball drop faster. So if you're not hitting topspin, you can't necessarily hit the ball very hard without sending it long. You definitely need to know how to hit topspin if you want to get the most possible power. So make sure to stay tuned because I'm going to go over how to use topspin on your drives. The last thing I want to mention is that you can also get a little bit more power with some simple modifications to your paddle, which I'm going to cover as well. So if you're interested in seeing that, stay tuned. We'll do that at the end of the video. Now I'm going to go through each element of getting more power on the forehand and backhand drive. Odds are if you're watching this video, you probably already know how to hit the ball. So most likely you're already doing some of these things right. But what I challenge you to do is look for the things that you aren't doing correctly. This is where the additional power is gonna come from. So let's get into it. So the first part of getting good power on your drives is your footwork and your weight transfer through the ball. You can't really get a ton of power if you're out of position and you're not getting your weight forward. So what we need to keep in mind is that your goal when you're hitting a ball hard in pickleball is to get your body weight going towards your target. So if my target's the player in front of me at the net, my goal when I hit that shot is to make my weight go towards them as I'm hitting my forehand or as I'm hitting my backhand. But in order to make that happen, I can't be out of position falling backward when I'm about to hit the shot. So before every time that you hit a drive, what you need to do is use your footwork to line yourself up right here. So I'm out in front of my body a little bit, out to my side, same on the backhand, focusing more on the forehand here though. I'm out in front of my body, out to the side. So if I'm hitting in a rally, it's my goal to catch the ball right there. Cause that is where I can drive my body weight towards my target. So before anything happens with our arm, we're worried about getting ourselves in position with our feet so that we're lined up perfectly right here. If I'm here or I'm too close to me, or the ball's behind me, I'm not gonna be able to hit it very hard. So it all starts with our footwork. And of course, once you hit that ball, you want to be getting your body weight forward through it. And the next part of our swing that we need to think about is our take back and what I like to call coiling. So if I'm hitting a forehand, a lot of my power is gonna come from rotating and unrotating when I'm hitting the ball. It's like if you're punching someone, you sort of rotate and then you unrotate to hit the ball, right? So I'm coiling and I uncoil, and a lot of my power comes from my paddle moving just from my body's rotation. So you don't wanna arm your stroke. So in order to get that coil though, when you're setting up for the ball, meanwhile, you should also be turning sideways. So when I'm setting up for my ball, I'm not facing my opponent, I'm setting up sideways, already turned so that I can rotate when I hit it. And the other thing you're doing when you're turning is you're taking back your paddle. So what I like to tell my students is the second they know they're gonna hit a forehand drive, the first thing you're gonna do is turn your shoulders and take back your paddle to this position right here. So this is sort of your first phase of the swing. And this is where you're actually moving to set up for that ball. So this is the position you get into that you line yourself up with that contact point with. So coil, and take back your paddle about right here to where we start the next portion of our swing, which is the loop. So the loop, not every player does the loop, but most players that come from a tennis background do the loop. All the loop is, is a C-shaped motion that we do with our hand and our paddle to get more momentum to hit the ball. So a loop looks like this. So when I hit the ball, I don't just take my paddle straight back. 
I actually come from a little bit higher with my tip of my paddle facing up, then I drop it down to this position, which is where I accelerate from, and I go from there, and this just gives you momentum. So most high-level players do loop, and most players that hit their forehand really hard also do the loop. And the way that you make the loop work is by being loose. So if I'm really tight, I don't get much out of the loop. When I'm loose though, I actually get momentum so that by the time I'm hitting the ball, it's going really fast. My paddle is going very fast because I sort of sped it up throughout the process of hitting the loop. So as a recap, we start off with our footwork and we're turning. We set up here and then when we're preparing to hit the ball, we drop it into position with our loop. On a one-handed backhand, I don't really recommend doing a big loop. I don't think it's super necessary. So it's more of a forehand thing in pickleball. So on a one-handed backhand, if you're doing a drive, I would just take it straight back and point it directly behind you like this. But the next two parts of our swing are probably the most important for getting power. And there are wrist lag and our rotation through the ball. So when I say wrist lag, as you're coming down from your loop, from here, this is what I would call the acceleration slot. The second you're going forward towards the ball, you want to make sure that your, the butt cap of your paddle is facing forward. And then when you go to hit the ball, your wrist will snap through a little bit. So a lot of the power on our motion comes from this tiny section of the swing with our wrist. So you see there, I can actually hit it pretty hard with just that wrist lag. So the way that you know that you're doing this is if your butt cap is facing forward as you're accelerating towards the ball. If you're accelerating towards the ball and the paddle face is in front of your hand, you're probably not lagging your wrist. So you need to make sure that you're loose. You can actually sort of try to make your butt cap face forward. You don't need to flop your, your paddle through the ball when you hit it. If your butt cap's facing forward when you're accelerating towards the ball, you're naturally sort of gonna snap through and get that extra power. So the wrist lag is super important. You can actually practice it just dropping the ball to yourself if you don't do it already, but it's huge. On the backhand, you don't necessarily need to lag your wrist as much. It actually probably comes a little more natural, the wrist lag on this side. It's sort of just like you're throwing a Frisbee. You don't need to make your butt cap face forward. If you're hitting hard on the backhand side, you'll naturally sort of probably get a little bit of wrist lag just because the way that your hand is positioned on this shot. So it's not as dramatic as the forehand. We're really trying to point that butt cap forward. And the last technical aspect of getting power is that rotation. And most people do this wrong. But there's a right way to get rotation where you get even more power. So the way I like to tell my students to rotate is you wanna start your rotation a little bit before you start accelerating your hand. If you rotate at the same time, you're still gonna get good power, but you get the most power when you create what's called the kinetic chain, where your body rotates first, and then your hand follows, kind of makes your body function more like a whip. So when you rotate your shoulders back square to your opponent, you go with your arm after, and it sort of makes your body function like a whip. And all this just sort of leads your paddle to go as fast as we can possibly send it through the ball. So. We do all of these different movements together and you get the fastest paddle speed when you hit the ball, which gives you the most power. So when it comes to rotation, we're rotating our upper body, but we're also rotating our hips, which means we have to rotate our feet. So if you look at my feet, I start in this position and I finish with my toe up. If I don't put my toe up, I can't really rotate my hips. So it's important that your feet are also a part of the rotation of your stroke. Back to topspin though. To get topspin on my drives, I need to make sure that before I hit the ball, I'm below it, and after I hit it, I'm above it. Because this is called the brush. So when I'm hitting that ball and I'm accelerating my paddle forward, I'm also brushing up behind it to get the ball to spin away from me. So what you need to think about is on your loop, if you're doing a loop, drop your paddle below the height of the ball. Because if you're at the same level of the ball, you physically can't get top spin. So you need to drop that paddle below the height of the ball so that when you hit it, you can go up. And in order to get a ton of power, you can't go up very much. So the trajectory of your stroke's more like this, just a little bit low to high, but mostly it's going forward and backward. So I'm setting my paddle forward a little bit like this, but I'm not hitting the ball like this because I don't get nearly enough power if I do that. 
And that actually can take away from your power if you're putting too much energy into the brush. So the main thing you need to think about, get below that ball in your acceleration slot, the point in which you start moving your paddle forward should probably be a little bit below the height of the ball. Not like super low, just a little bit. And when you go from here, get a little bit of that upward motion, which should give you that topspin. And you should be able to feel it. If you can't feel that you're getting topspin, you're probably doing something wrong. One thing players do wrong is they don't actually get below the height of the ball. They just think they are. And they're not actually brushing up on it. So you need to maybe watch yourself in the mirror, hitting it slowly or something, so that you know you're getting below that height of the ball and brushing up. Now guys, I'm gonna take you through how we use our powerful drives in real points. And as you'll realize, it's not all about power. So in these examples, I challenge you to try to pay attention to the other things that I'm trying to do other than hit hard. Before I get into that though, I wanna tell you about our product, the Dink Master. If you're the type of player that struggles with reacting to hard shots and reacting to power, the Dink Master is one of the best ways to get comfortable with that. So you see here, all I'm doing is going really fast on the Dink Master, and my goal is to keep every shot that I can below the green line. So what this does is it trains me to be able to keep the ball low when my opponents are hitting hard at me. So if you're interested in getting faster reflexes and faster reaction time, highly recommend the Dink Master. It's just such an awesome way to get in extra reps when you're at home. Right now we're just in a driveway. Imagine how much better you'd be if you could do this for five minutes every day. Your results would skyrocket. Let's get into it. That was a good example of a good shot to go for a drive because it was shorter and it sat up higher. So when you're hitting a third shot drive, the best opportunity to do so is when the return is landing closer to the net and it's sitting up a little bit higher. And where I took it was right down the middle. So going right down the middle is probably the best shot to hit your drive, especially if you're hitting it from the middle because you can confuse your opponents and it minimizes the chances that you'll miss out to the sides of the court. So if you want to replay that point, it was a great example of a drive that you should go for and that will work for you consistently. There, I pretty much did the same exact thing on the other side. So I have a two-handed backhand, but if you have a one-handed backhand drive, going down the middle on either side from the middle is a great play. And we actually use that to come in. So we used that drive like a drop because I hit it so powerful. He didn't have a very good opportunity to hit the ball back deep. So we used that as a ticket in and I won the point with the next shot. So that was an example of why you need a good amount of power on your drives for them to be effective. There, I didn't hit that very hard and it sat up. So Drew, pretty much just ended the point on that first shot. So when you're hitting your drives, one, you need that power, but you also need it to be within probably a foot and a half of the net or else you're giving your opponents an easy volley. So we're really aiming in this region when we're hitting our drives because if it's higher, it's super easy. When it's lower and you have top spin, sometimes you can actually make your opponent hit the ball below the height of the net so they have to hit it up, which gives you a ticket to move forward. Yeah. That was another good example where I got a super short return and went right down the middle. Had Sid, he didn't have much time to react. I got a free point. So if you have a really short return like that and your opponents aren't necessarily the greatest with their reflexes, but even if they are, it's a good opportunity to go hard and take over the kitchen. Gosh. So that's a good example of what I'd call the crash. So a lot of the time, if you hit a really good drive, your opponents might pop it up. And rather than let that shot bounce, it's smartest to move forward, take that shot out of the air and kill it. So if you've seen the shake and bake play, that's essentially the same thing where your partner takes the crash. There, I had the drive, move forward, and was able to end the point because my opponents popped it up. So if you can hit a really good drive, that can actually happen pretty often. And guys, as I said earlier in the video, one of the best ways to give yourself more power without any extra effort is to actually add some weight on your paddle. So see here on this paddle, I just put on some lead tape and probably the most common spot that players put on their lead tape is right here in the throat sections of the paddle. So this is called the throat where it rises up. 
And when you put it here, this is sort of the minimal effect that lead can have. So it's closer to your hand and the closer the lead is to your hand, the less you'll feel it. So if you've never tried lead tape, I recommend putting some on here and you might be able to handle it. If you're the kind of player that doesn't get tennis elbow and can handle a heavier paddle, then you should probably try some lead tape. You probably will like it actually. And if you come from tennis, this shouldn't be too heavy at all. A pickleball paddle is only eight ounces max and a tennis racket's almost 11 ounces. So if you can handle a tennis racket, a little lead tape on the pickleball paddle shouldn't be too bad. The other spot I like to put lead tape is right here and right here. So if you put it up here, you'll feel it a little bit more. You'll get more power. But as you start to put more lead on your paddle, what you need to keep in mind is that it might slow down your reaction time a little bit. It might make it a little bit harder to maneuver the paddle, but the more lead you put on, the more power you will get. So if you want more power, putting on some lead is never a bad idea. It's going to give you more power. And it also makes the sweet spot of your paddle bigger, which just helps everything. So a little bit of lead can definitely help you out. We make our own. If you want to check it out, you can go below the video to the description. We have it linked. If not, though, you're totally fine. Not everyone uses lead. It's more of a person by person thing. If you're the kind of player that gets tennis elbow and that doesn't necessarily like a heavy paddle, it's totally fine to not use lead but I would say 80% of players prefer to use a little bit. So it's definitely something that helps a lot of people and I recommend checking it out. And now that everyone knows I did all these hard drives, there's gonna be a lot more bangers as we call them or players that hit really hard and everything. So if you wanna learn how to beat these types of players and defend against the hard shots when you're at the net and they're the ones hitting the drives, I go through the entire strategy of how to beat bangers and react better to their hard shots. Watch this.